Hi, I'm Candice Rondo. I'm director of the Future Frontlines program at New America, and I'm a practice State University Center on the Future of War. I am so glad that you are all able to join us today, and I really want to thank you. We're really looking forward to diving into this conversation on the anniversary of the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Um, we have a lot uh, of great panelists, great speakers, um, some very experienced researchers um, and, and policy experts with us today. Um, but before we get into the conversation, uh, I wanna just do a little bit of housekeeping. First of all, I wanna encourage you all um, to um, join us in the conversation during the Q&A. Uh, we have a, you know, a two hour conversation here uh, and we really wanna be in dialogue with you. And if you look at the um, bottom of, the, of your screen, you're gonna see uh, there's a, a Slido little uh, button there for you to, to join in uh, and put your questions in the Q&A chat. Um, also, uh, if you're interested in the reports, uh, they are online and they are, you can also access those again at the bottom of the screen on the right-hand side. Um, we have a fantastic event uh, and obviously a lot of research um, to share with you. Um, but before, again, getting deep into all of this, um, I want to set the context a little bit. Uh, you know, a year ago today, uh, just about a mile from where I live here in Washington, D.C., uh, and actually almost exactly to the hour, uh, democracy in America really took a very dark uh, and unprecedented turn in its history on January 6th. Um, thousands of Americans who traveled to Washington from all over the country uh, stormed the Capitol as members of Congress who were seeking to certify the results of the 2020 presidential election. Uh, a lot of the folks who showed up that day were spurred on by President Donald Trump uh, at the time. Uh, and they were inspired by the Stop the Steal movement, which we all now know um, it was a massive campaign uh, to um, spread disinformation about the election uh, and the election's integrity. And they were also inspired by other sentiments, including white supremacy, um, anti-government sentiment, um, and, and an idea that, um, you know, uh, that sovereign citizens um, should um, be more responsible than the federal government for the rule of law in this country. Um, many were average citizens, uh, but many also came prepared for battle uh, and fully armed, as we saw. Five police officers died that day as a result of the violence, and two women, supporters of Donald Trump, also died that day. Hundreds were injured, including many police officers uh, who are local here to our community in Washington, D.C., uh, and many also were challenged later um, by you know, the results of post-traumatic stress uh, and are still sorting through that today. Um, really important to know that this event uh, was a thunderclap um, for so many people uh, and has changed so many lives in this country, um, but has also really um, destabilized our democracy in a very profound way. Uh, it's no surprise though, um, for a lot of the folks who are on this, um, in this event today, uh, many of us were watching. Uh, we saw the rising tide of hate and disinformation online um, in, in the year leading up to uh, January 6th. Researchers, journalists, concerned citizens were all ringing the alarm bells saying, we've got a problem, the red lights are flashing. Um, we saw this on Facebook, we saw it on Twitter, we saw it on YouTube, um, and we also saw it on this growing ecosystem uh, of the alternative tech movement um, that tends to target uh, far-right audiences, uh, you know, on pl platforms like Parler, Gab, and Rumble. And much of what we know actually happened on those platforms. Um, all of the, many of the tips that the FBI has received over the last year, uh, 300,000 we heard from Merrick Garland yesterday, the Attorney General of the United States, um, actually came from online digital evidence. Uh, some of it was on Parler, some of it was on Facebook. Um, we know the story. Uh, and it's not just Americans who are watching that day. Billions of people around the world who had access to social media also were watching this debacle unfold uh, in real time online. Uh, and it has reshaped the way the world looks at America and understands our promotion of democracy uh, and, our, and our defense of democracy in this country. Um, the folks who are with us today uh, are all part of this story. Uh, and um, they really <laughs> have been champions of trying to understand what happened that day. Um, it's worth noting, in fact, I must note <laughs> that our partners uh, on this event, 
uh, include the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensics Research Lab, um, Arizona State University, um, the Bridging Divides Initiative at Princeton University, uh, as well as Just Security and Tech Policy Press, uh, all of whom are represented here in some way or another today. Um, and so this is really a truly a team effort, but it's also really indicative of just how urgent and critical it is for us to understand what happened uh, on January 6th, what it means for the future of democracy in this country, and the potential for more political violence to erupt as we creep into uh, the midterm election season and then move toward the 2024 elections. Um, our first panel today will be moderated by Mary McCord. Uh, Mary is um, just a profoundly uh, influential figure when it comes to thinking about national security, uh, not just in Washington, but across the country. She is well known for her 20 plus years of, uh, of work as a federal prosecutor, as a defender of democracy in many different, uh, and hence she's worn many different hats over time. Um, most recently, she was, before joining ICAP as the executive director, um, she was the acting assistant attorney general for national security from 2016 to 2017. And uh, before that, she was the assistant attorney general for national security from 2014 to 2016. Um, so many more things to say about Mary, um, but perhaps that will be revealed uh, as we chat today about our research uh, on um, the alt tech world and the future of political violence in this country. Over to you, Mary. Thank you, Candace, and, and thanks to New America and ASU and uh, Tech Policy Press and uh, Just Security and Bridging Divides and DFR Labs, Atlantic Council, also my good friends for being part of this and, and uh, really looking forward to this discussion. Um, I want to jump right in because I, I think there's a lot of uh, interest, obviously, in this topic, and I want to make sure we have uh, time for um, questions from the audience, so be thinking about those as we go along. And Candice, I just want to start with you uh, as the project lead for this. Uh, and before I do that, I should also indicate, in addition to Candice here, who's already introduced herself, we have Ben Dalton, who is a, a fellow at the Future Frontlines Project, um, and also Professor Sean Walker, who also uh, is a researcher and um, a professor who worked on this project. Um, and I want to really dive into this research, but before we do, I mean, I think many of us who have been uh, tracking extremist movements, whether they are domestic extremist movements or foreign extremist movements over the years, have seen that social media has played a role in recruitment, in propagandizing, in planning. I saw this at, at the National Security Division. I saw foreign terrorist organizations do this. I saw this at the National Security Division and is in my current role at Georgetown University's Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection, I've seen it with respect to domestic extremist movements, including um, many that you mentioned, the unlawful private militia movements, conspiracy theorists, accelerationists, white supremacist movements, et cetera. So in setting out on this project, I know you focused on Parler. What was it that you, what questions were you really trying to answer? What, we, what was the goal of this, of this particular research, this particular project? Well, I mean, I'll speak for myself, and I know that you know each of us had, I think, you know, different motivations and different questions in mind, uh, and we all come from different backgrounds. You know, for instance, I'm a journalist. You know, Sean uh, is an information science researcher. Uh, ben is also a journalist. Uh, we have other colleagues who are mathematicians on this project. Uh, you know, uh, data scientists and so forth. Um, for for me, I will say, um, a big question was, you know, there were all these claims about you know, the role of Parler in, in the immediate aftermath of the attack. Sheryl Sandberg, uh, the CEO of Facebook at the time, uh, you know, blamed Parler and Rumble and all these other sort of alt tech um, sort of fringe platforms uh, for being more responsible for the spread of disinformation uh, and violent and hateful uh, speech online uh, ahead of the elections and also, of course, leading up to the attack. Um, and, and the question is, you know, first of all, uh, Facebook, of course, has had challenges with its credibility uh, when it makes these types of claims. Um, but my question was, well, how would you know? Um, how would you know um, whether Parler was more responsible than Facebook or Twitter? I mean, it seemed like a very um, unfair comparison. Parler had about 15 million users at the time, uh, while Facebook had almost 3 billion, mm -hmm. right? Um, and Twitter probably had close to 2 billion itself. 
So it's it seemed a little bit like an apples and oranges, you know, mm -hmm. comparison, uh, and and yet you know there was something to it, right? What we know from looking at the data and from what happened that day, what unfolded. In fact, a f quite a few people were indicted because they were filmed and, and then they posted their stuff, you know, online to Parler. Uh, you know, what we know is that it was an important part of the story, and it was so important that you know after the fact. Only three days later, Amazon decided to shut it down, uh, and so did Apple, right, uh, and Google, right. So it was taken offline, um, and that was really a thunderclap. So for me, what, you know, one of the questions is, how do you measure the effect of one platform versus another? Mm -hmm. um, like, what are the tools, um, you know, that you use to do that, and can you can you really say with any kind of definitive sense that Okay, this platform was more responsive than the other. Uh, it turns out you can't, but you know we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that. I also, I mean, I think everybody was really curious to understand how many of the folks who have since been arrested um, actually were active online on on these sort of right. fringe platforms like Parler and like Rumble. And we certainly found that they were active, uh, and that it was you know it was a factor for a lot of these folks. Um, but there's still more work to do on that. Yeah. No, and you know it's so important to try to trace this for purposes of you know are there legislative initiatives that ought to be considered by Congress? Are there just good corporate go governance policies that ought to you know come out of this? Among other things, you know the accountability was a big theme of of course Attorney General Merrick Garland's speech yesterday. We're not necessarily here talking about accountability in a criminal sense, although maybe we should be um, for the platforms, but certainly accountability in terms of what was their role, right, in, in this first uh, significant attack on the Capitol in over two, 200 years. Um, I, want, I want to hear from Ben and Sean both on this question, because I know you each approached it from a slightly different perspective. So, so Ben? Yeah, so um, I, we sort of structured our research in, in a trio of um, influencers, people who were in the Trump orbit, um, celebrities uh, who were, you know, sort of the top line of, of discourse, um, objectors who were the members of Congress who objected to the certification of, uh, of the electoral results, and a group that we're calling the contesters, who are the individuals who were arrested and charged uh, with crimes um, related to their alleged activities on January 6th. And I spent the most time focusing on that third group. And what really drove me uh, was just, you know, who were these people? Um, were they everyday Americans? Were they, you know, militia groups? We saw, you know, such a diversity of, of, of actors on that day. And I was interested in, you know, where they came from, what had activated them. Um, and yeah, particularly the sort of the online offline crossover uh, where their online networks would cross over into um, you know, offline activism and vice versa, where they would uh, draw from, uh, you know, protests and events to, to fuel the online conversation. So that's really kind of what informed my, my uh, part of this, of this project and, and what struck my interest the most. And I want to come back in detail uh, to that too, because that's one of the things, you know, I did a ton of speaking through 2020 and through 2021 about this sort of uh, online, offline relationship. And so, but of course, I speak not as a researcher, I speak as a lawyer and an observer and a consumer of the research of you and others. Uh, and just based on what I see and what people report to me who've been impacted in communities. And, you know, I, I deeply felt that there was that connection, but to have the empirical data is, is so important. Sean, can you just give us a little bit of your, you know, your, what you went into this project hoping to, to learn? Sure. For me, I was really interested in the role, the connectivity between Parler and other platforms, and also the sort of texture of Parler. Was Parler similar type of communication that's happening? Was that similar to what's happening on, say, Facebook or Twitter, platforms that many people know? Uh, or is it something completely different? And the answer to that is actually it's really completely different. The mm -hmm. types of language that we see um, from sort of the general members, as well as, as Ben mentioned, these objectors, right, these 147 members of Congress, they're using different language. Um, it's much more uh, caustic, I would say, than what we see on their public presences on mainstream platforms like Twitter and Facebook. So we, we did some analysis where we looked at their public official Twitter accounts, and then we also looked at what they deleted from those accounts, and then we looked at um, the objectors. We found 46 of those that had parlor accounts, and 13 of those were highly active. 
And the language is very striking and different. They're not talking about stop this deal in their public uh, Twitter accounts. They're talking about that in parlor in this space in a very caustic accusatory way. Also, the platform kind of changes over time. And so what we've seen is that um, in 2018 to 2019, it's not really that active and not really um, a lot of folks are using it. But then there's this exodus as mainstream platforms like Facebook and Twitter kick up their content moderation, folks migrate from those platforms to Parler, and then activity starts to change. And then around the election, the types of content that's posted becomes more conspiracy theory, much more extreme over time. And so that, that was one of the things that I was really interested in and kind of surprising of that fact about how eventually disconnected Parler became and this sort of uh, greenhouse that helped to grow conspiracy theories and extremist content. Well, let's let's start right there because that actually is one of the things I wanted to to get us into before we get on to, into sort of some of the other like correlations that you found, which is exactly how does that content differ and how do the users differ? Because as Candice pointed out, we're talking about I mean the numbers are still big, fifteen million, but in comparison to Facebook and Twitter, it's it's minuscule. So who who's using this? Who's drawn to it? And how how it how is that content different and how much is posting and reposting from other platforms? Sure, I'll start if that's okay with everyone. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what we see um, user-wise, there's a lower number of users, um, but I think what's important to note is that around the summer of 2020, we start to see politicians and other folks, uh, celebrity figures start to migrate to Parler. A lot of this is because there's uh, conversations, you know, myths about content moderation saying that mainstream platforms are suppressing uh, conservative content, um, which I think there's a confusion about uh, conservative content versus misinformation. Um, a lot of studies have shown that conservative content's not actually being suppressed, but uh, there was this belief, this myth. And so that caused folks to shift. And as mainstream figures shifted, then Parler became more legitimate. So pre this shift, Parler was, a, was really this fringe platform, but as mainstream folks move, like, Paul Gosar, Nunez, uh, Andy Biggs and such move to the platform, then they provide this legitimacy. Uh, in the content shift, one of the analyses we did was look at sort of the links that people posted, um, especially these uh, objectors uh, and these influential users in Trump's orbit. We see when they first come onto the platform around the summer of 2020, we see that they're still linking to other social media platforms. They're linking to some mainstream news sources, Fox News, some BBC, some New York Times. Um, but if, uh, but then we see as closer to the election and beyond, we start to see that shift to sites that uh, basically broker and misinformation. So sites like the Gateway Pundit and such, we see that shift into that, uh, connections to that misinformation ecosphere information space versus uh, mainstream media and news. So we see that shift over time of that type of content. And what about the users, and maybe this is a good question for you, Ben, the users who are not the, you told us about your three categories and that you focused on the, um, uh, what did you call them, that last category? Yeah, contesters. Contesters, yes, thank you. So we're talking about ordinary people who just believe the election was stolen, right? Or users of Parler. Who, who are we talking about when we talk about the contesters? Well, not necessarily. So um, one thing that's really striking about them is, is their diversity, not necessarily in terms of demographics because they were you know, overwhelmingly male, uh, lots of military background, lots of um, uh, sort of law enforcement background, but you know they came from practically every state in the country. Um, and they really varied between people who seemingly were activated on an individual or even like a family level. We had actually a couple of entire families who ended up getting um, arrested and indicted all the way through to these organized groups that have attracted quite a bit of attention, such as the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, um, and the Proud Boys. Um, and it's the latter group who are facing some of the most serious charges related to that day, um, conspiracy charges uh, related to obstructing a formal congressional proceeding, which was obviously the certification of the electoral vote. So um, I, I, I hesitate to call them everyday Americans, um, but certainly, you know, there were some people who, who seemingly just sort of got swept along for the ride. Mm -hmm. um, Parler's influence, you know, I, I'm interested to know, um, 
you know, we just learned since Francis Haugen, the Facebook whistleblower has, uh, you know, provided a, very, a tranche of papers and other documents and information that she brought with her from Facebook. Uh, we've learned that um, Facebook, you know, made some pretty significant changes in how it was approaching taking down content both before the election and after the election. And the Washington Post ProPublica just yesterday published results of their own research into the impact of Facebook's decision just post January 6th, or just post the election day to dismantle its civic integrity task force. It had, you know, to its credit, before the election, it had recognized its platform was being used for disinformation and to foment violence. It had implemented its dangerous individuals and organizations policy and other policies to take down uh, violent content and some, uh, you know, disinformation content. And that's not only, I think, about the election, but also about COVID and, and other things like that, right, which were all uh, at issue in the um, in 2020 leading up to the election. But what we've learned is that right after the election, they basically dismantled that task force. And in the period between election day and January 6th, I believe the uh, data I saw yesterday is that Facebook groups swelled with at least 650,000 posts attacking the legitimacy of the election. So Candace, I believe you started us out off uh, talking a little bit about the finger pointing by Facebook at group at platforms like um, Parler and Gab and, and Rumble. But what does this show us about Facebook's, you know, role in, uh, uh, you know, undermining government, governmental institutions and fomenting the violence on January 6th? And is there a way, coming back again to your initial qu question that you wanted to answer, to kind of compare that to Parler's role? Yeah, I mean, so one of the things that I think is also kind of worth noting here, just kind of tailing off some of the things that we observed, um, in our research and you know where Ben and, and Sean were just kind of referencing sort of who are these users um, and kind of what was driving the conversation online on Parler and elsewhere. I mean there was a real notable convergence between uh, you know a reaction to COVID restrictions right that was a big theme uh, and really important um, the, the Black Lives Matter protests uh, mm -hmm. that erupted uh, in you know right after George Floyd's killing uh, in May of 2020. Um, there's a real close alignment, right, with these, it's almost like a sine wave, um, where you see, you know, more, more people joining, either because um, they're starting to identify with this idea of being in this, you know, being part of the free speech movement as advertised by Parler and other alt tech uh, platforms. And, and so there's kind of like this synergistic effect of these offline events happening, right, real world, COVID, restrictions, um, responses to that, and then the Black Lives Matter movement, and then counter protests, um, escalating violence on the streets, you know, from all different uh, angles. And, um, and that conversation is getting more and more heated on all of these platforms. Uh, and, uh, you know, and we could talk about, I think, there's a temptation to think that Facebook did a lot, and it did. <laughs> there was definitely, you know, the, the integrity um, uh, efforts were certainly significant, and they they clearly did drive some, um, you know, from Facebook onto platforms like Parler, as we said. Uh, however, um, six hundred fifty thousand that's that's just what you know the Washington Post and ProPublica were able to find in the time given and with the resources at hand. Um, you know, we know, you know, that there's more out there, mm -hmm. um, and. There's a real parallel, right? And I'm not at all surprised to hear that, you know, there was after November, um, there was this escalation of activity on Facebook uh, in groups uh, because we saw the same thing in Parler. And, you know, we saw, and I'm certain that if we went to every single platform uh, and we sort of took a look, you know, we would see that escalation, um, especially if we're using certain types of hashtags and certain types of terms. Uh, and we would see that, um, that alignment basically. So it's, I think the thing, the question I, I have is sort of, you know, why, what, what logic informed Facebook's executives and decision makers um, as they were thinking through what would happen after the fact? Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, it was pretty clear um, right from the start that Donald Trump intended to contest the results. Mm -hmm. He said so. <laughs> uh, yeah, he yeah. said it repeatedly. No surprise. Right. No surprise. I mean, he said it in, he said it in public debates, right? Mm -hmm. He said it on Twitter. Um, I mean, he had surrogates saying it for him. Um, and so, 
I'm I'm at a loss to understand, you know, what part of that message Facebook executives and others, you know, at Twitter and elsewhere, that they weren't understanding, um, that they weren't hearing for some reason. Um, and why why stand down, um, you know, a, a team that was meant to really protect our institutions right at this crucial, very sensitive period. I hope um, that now we know, right, that one of the lessons learned is, um, unfortunately, you've got to, it's got to be kind of around the clock now vigilance. Um, it's not literally just about the election cycle. And I don't know, we're almost rarely not in an election cycle. This is a rare year, right? Um, so every two years, we've got something going on, um, which really means every every other year, we've got something going on. So, you know, for tech companies, large or small, you know, Parler, Facebook, Rumble, uh, you name it, they really have to be thinking through what is the logic here? And the logic has to be around, look, it's the biggest show, not just in the United States, in the world. Um, the, when the presidents of the United States is elected in this country, um, everybody in the world is watching for the results. And everybody in the world has a view. And, um, and they know that it matters. So, um, you know, and I don't see that changing, you know, anytime soon. So the, the real question here is like, how do we establish measures um, that are uh, informed by the evidence, right? Informed by what we know also about like how these technologies work. Right. Yeah, well, so let's get to that. We talked a little bit about the online, offline. We talked about this call and response. I mean, one of the things that I observed through 2020, well, actually before that even, uh, ever since Trump came into office was, but certainly amping up in 2020 with the COVID uh, pandemic hitting, stay at home orders, governor shut down orders. I would, uh, then the killing of George Floyd and racial justice demonstrations and then the seeding of the stop the steal um, movement even before the election. Um, what I was seeing was President Trump would come out and make forceful statements, you know, um, against governor's public health orders, such as stay at home orders and, and cons you know, correlative with that at the same time as that his online statements through Twitter, his public appearances and statements, you would then see offline, you know, armed storming of state houses in places like Michigan and in Idaho and many other places in opposition to governor's ordered um, uh, public health measures. Same thing with the racial justice demonstrations. When Trump would say, these are not peaceful, these are violent anarchists who are rioting and looting, then you start seeing armed private militias heeding that call, uh, coming out, deploying on the streets, heavily armed, intimidating people, trying to exercise their First Amendment rights, and obviously putting people in grave danger. We've had multiple people, people shot and, and killed, and now, of course, we have the unfortunate uh, situation of of Kyle Rittenhouse now being hailed as a as a hero, a vigilante um, hero, and so and then the same thing I saw with the election. You know, Trump starts talking in April of 2020 about mail in balloting is highly susceptible to fraud and just building up this narrative um, that then you started seeing people starting to come out on the streets. You know, we have to oppose mail in balloting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, but I don't think Trump had a parlor account. Right. So how we and I don't know if which one of you's best, uh, you know, position to answer it or maybe all three of you. So how, you know, I think of so much of his activity being on Twitter, being on Facebook. How did that translate into the parlor discourse on these subjects and the then offline activity related to it? Um, so first of all, Trump did actually team Trump did. did have team a parlor Trump. account. Um, Ivanka Trump had a parlor account. Don Jr. had a parlor account. So it was a it was a family affair on both. Um, and you know they joined. You know, I think I'm not sure actually about the join dates. I'll have to ask Sean a little bit about that. Um, but it, you know, it certainly wasn't in 2018 right away. Right. Um, you know, it, which is when of course Parlor was launched. They had a presence, and that presence was outside. But interestingly. Um, they weren't as active, right? But their surrogates were extremely active. So Lynn Wood is one of the top posters on Parler. Um, you know, we found that uh, Joe Pags, who's a you know a Fox News commentator, um, you know, and a, and a close you know Trump supporter and surrogate, uh, he was I think number two after Ron Paul in terms of you know numbers of posts 
uh, you know, throughout his entire use on Parlor 1.0. Um, so the surrogates actually were extremely important. Uh, and, and in fact, that for us, I think was one of the more shocking findings just to see just how outsized their influence was. So if you were, you know, in theory, if you're opening Parlor uh, as a normal user, average Joe, um, you open it up, you're gonna probably see some content there um, from a Trump surrogate right away uh, because of the way the platform is designed, right? It's not just because of what the content is, which is a really, really important distinction. Um, there's a lot of, I think, over-focus on content and its moderation. It's, this is more about decisions around um, who um, gets pushed up the yeah. ranks, right? Um, and so that, those are algorithmic decisions, right? Those are design feature decisions um, and who gets privileged as a result. And then also, um, you know, one of the things that's still a mystery to us, I think we're gonna try and research this a little bit is um, who actually profits from it, right? Because there was this very strange business model uh, where Parler said, you know, we don't sell your data to third parties. Um, and it's probably because they didn't have to because most of that stuff is was publicly available on Parler 1.0, uh, which is why we know so much, right? Because you know, it was all just sort of out there. Uh, and there weren't a lot of privacy protections for Parler users. Um, but, you know, back to your point about kind of the special treatment of VIPs, right? Uh, and Trump in particular on these others of mainstream platforms and Facebook and Twitter and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's sort of unconscionable uh, to think that VIPs, um, you know, who are, you know, spreading disinformation at the level that Trump was in literally inciting violence. Um, you know, for years, um, were not in some way restrained. I, I think, you know, Twitter has done a great job, comparatively speaking, of actually adopting some logic. Um, you know, you've got the now, you've got the five strikes, right? Um, we just saw that happen with Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's been now permanently banned from the platform. Um, I mean, at least there's a logic there, and it's, it's right up there up front. The problem with Facebook is the logic always seems to come after the fact. Um, and then it doesn't seem to apply uh, across the board. They seem to have a real problem with definition of terms. And, you know, for an organization that, you know, is worth, I don't know, I mean, it's like a trillion plus, right? Um, you know, and that has so many smart people working for it from around the world um, and in the United States, uh, many of them actually lawyers <laughs> um, who love definition of terms. It's mysterious to me uh, that um, these, these mainstream platforms um, don't want to take that on. Um, and don't want to be more transparent about that. And I guess that's where the congressional piece comes in, right? Is, you know, lawmakers have to really press them um, to, to either take on, build consensus around definitions of terms, right? Um, like, what does it mean to, to have inauthentic behavior on a form? What does it mean um, to have disinformation or misinformation? And, and also, obviously, the research community needs to do this work. But honestly, it's going to be up to policymakers. I think Sean probably has some ideas about this, too, though. Yeah, uh, sure. And just to answer your question, uh, Team Trump joined Parler in late, so December of 2018. Ivanka Trump joined uh, Parler in uh, December of 2020. Uh, I'll look that up real quick. Um, Interesting. I think, so after the election. Yes. Um, and so one of the things I would add, too, is that um, with the theme of Parler being really different, right? If you weren't on Parler, I think it's difficult to really understand how different this platform is. You just, a lot of folks might overlay their experiences with Facebook or Twitter or Reddit or Instagram. Uh, but we see that uh, Parler really didn't have a content moderation team. That's one of the reasons why Apple and Google uh, removed the app from their app stores because their lack of content moderation. There was a very small content moderation team and there was very little content that was moderated and that content um, you do not want to view. Uh, that content was just really explicit and inappropriate uh, in, in, in an extreme, right? Versus what we see in um, platforms like Facebook and Twitter, right? They have a larger content moderation team. And to be fair, like this idea of content moderation is very difficult, right? We don't have good solutions. It's kind of like uh, taking out your appendix with a chainsaw. In many ways, um, it doesn't really help. But we also know uh, some of our conceptions about misinformation are really problematic right now. We think, you know, if we delete content, then it will stop spreading. In some cases, deleting content makes it sort of more juicy and more valuable. So mm -hmm. we saw that with the pandemic video um, early uh, in the COVID uh, 
or in COVID times. And then we saw that with sort of Parler became more juicy because a uh, result of content being deleted on mainstream platforms. And we often think about if we just delete content, then we stop it spread. But we have to kind of think about misinformation. People don't adopt and spread misinformation because they're dumb, right? Like do your own research is my least favorite phrase that I can yeah. like ever hear on the news, like ever, right? Um, and so I think we also need to think about the relationships that a lot of folks that were on Parler um, and were supporting Stop the Steal and uh, the Trump network and all these COVID protests and such, we want to think about their sort of relationship with that information. There are reasons why, right? We adopt and spread misinformation because it has some value to us. And, and that might be it's our relationship to government officials. It might be our relationship and feelings about President Trump. Um, it might be because we want to protect our children. So that's why we're believing COVID misinformation about vaccines, because we want some way to keep our children safe. And science sometimes takes a little while to develop. So I think we need to think about the role of fact checking, the role of content removal, the role of account suppression. And then how does that can cascade over time? Right? Like that's one set of solutions in our toolbox, but that's a very blunt solution to the problem. And so thinking about these relationships, thinking about some of the historical reasons why folks uh, believe some of this uh, content and this misinformation is really important. And the platforms are not equipped to do some of this, but also some of their methods are just really poor. Like if, if I post something and you know, Facebook pops up and says, well, we think this is misinformation, right? Like what's the psychological effect of someone on someone whenever the platform themselves labels something that they believe to be true as misinformation. And oftentimes it's not about truth or fa uh, false, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's not the problem. It's normally about a whole set of values that folks are adopting. And we could see that as folks moved to Parler and the content on Parler, right? And especially as Parler starts to disconnect from the rest of the world, it becomes more extreme over time because uh, it becomes this isolated platform that we don't have contesting voices. Instead, mm -hmm. we have voices that are kind of continuing to add fuel to the conspiracy theory and to these misinformation narratives. Mm -hmm. They just become more extreme because they're not running into anything that's a counter to that. Just to add on to a few things that Sean said there, when he says that like the most sort of extreme stuff, like the worst of the worst might get moderated, sure. But like, you know, some of the contesters that I looked at, their, their posting history, uh, you know, there were occasionally explicit calls to violence that just seemingly went unmoderated. Um, and uh, we, we've used the metaphor sort of as like a hothouse that parlor served as a hothouse as it disconnected from the rest of the conversation where discourse would sort of come in to the platform, um, intensify, and then gradually leak out elsewhere on the internet. Um, and I saw this in particular with, with users that had multiple accounts on many different platforms and were posting to all of them at the same time. They would save their sort of most pointed vituperative commentary for parlor um, and then tone it down or couch it a little bit on places like Twitter or Facebook, but the messaging remained consistent across all of them. Mm -hmm. Right, and I think one other, sorry, just to jump in here. Mm -hmm. One thing that we haven't really talked about or mentioned in, great, uh, you know, in a great deal is, so you have that kind of um, intensity or intensification of this uh, increasingly extreme content and sentiment online. But also one of the features of par Parler that is really important to understand is because there were few safeguards, in fact, like the moderation of 1.0 was driven by users, 800 users roughly um, to 15 million. Okay, that's just crazy. Um, it doesn't make any sense. And it's also user driven. So, you know, their standards are who knows, right? Nobody knows what those standards are. Um, but because you don't have those safeguards, that also means that inauthentic behavior can happen. What do we mean by inauthentic behavior? We mean literally, you know, the deployment of bots to elevate, retweet, or sorry, sorry repost or reparlor, <laughs> uh, you know, information online. Uh, it means coordinated um, action by different users who, who may be sharing um, a singular account. Um, I mean, we saw this at scale. And in a way that I am not certain, um, I mean, perhaps it does happen on Facebook, we don't know. Again, we have so many sort of black box situations in all of these platforms, um, but Parler was remarkable in, in that it was really vulnerable to a lot of coordinated inauthentic behavior. I mean, and then yeah. I agree we wouldn't see that sort of activity. Um, so in some of the posting rates we saw are just not humanly possible and other platforms would have shut that down due to some rate limiting. Right. But I think this is an important point to note that 
as a platform, part of the infrastructure was really poorly designed. It was really amateur hour is an understatement. And um, so the platform wasn't secure. Um, there were sort of no safeguards again on automated posting. And then as, you know, after the election in uh, around January 6th, right, as people started, like companies that supported Parler and provided services to Parler started to abandon it, then their security infrastructure, what was there just fell apart. And so that's one of the reasons why uh, hackers and different groups were able to access data. I mean, even driver's licenses from those that had verified their profiles, all that information was accessible because it was just so poorly designed until Amazon flipped the switch to turn off the lights. And as part of our work, trying to collect some of that data as it was just disappearing really quickly, that was part of our struggle. To what extent did you find, you know, foreign actors, foreign influences taking advantage of these vulnerabilities, Sean? I think that's a good Candace question, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm going to pass off to Candace first and then I'll, I'll respond after Candace. So Stanford did a great study um, almost immediately after the attack. Um, and so they really have to be commended for the work that they did. Um, one of the things, of course, that they noted was that there were a lot of users from Brazil uh, and Saudi Arabia that joined around 2019, and, and there was a huge presence. Um, and in fact, I guess that was in response to you know stuff going on in those countries, but also clearly kind of an identification with this authoritarian strongman model of governance, right? And then that's why the conversation was driven to Parler. Um, most certainly there was some inauthentic behavior there. We do know that, uh, that has been established. Um, we also know from a study that Graphica did, uh, which is a New York based organization that looks at disinformation, uh, that uh, you know, uh, offshoots of the internet research agency, um, you know, the Russian uh, troll farm uh, and sort of factory for disinformation also were really active on Parler as well. Um, so there's definitely, you know, those prior studies are already there. It's established, it was happening. Um, we, we believe, you know, that there are, there's probably strong evidence, particularly, I think, among some of those folks who uh, are user accounts that were linked to QAnon, uh, that was probably a pretty big vector for a lot of automated uh, content uh, uploading uh, and, and transfer, and that probably foreign actors were involved there, but I think that bears greater study. Right, thanks. Yeah, I know I should be um, switching now to audience questions, but I'm going to take moderator's prerogative because there's a topic we haven't really touched on much at all that I think it's important to, to hear from you on. Uh, one of the things I found really interesting reading through your report is you really did do kind of a deep dive into some of the people that had been in, in, indicted uh, based on their role in the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. And so I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about what you saw in terms of patterns or trends with respect to those who were indicted, their use of Parler, how they used it. I know you did a super deep dive into two individuals in particular. Um, and I'm also interested if you can, I, I, the other thing I found very interesting about this and data analysis was that correlation geographically between the residences of the indicted uh, indicted individuals and areas that had seen large numbers of protests and demonstrations, not all about the elections, but about COVID, about racial justice, et cetera. And some of these were, were violent uh, demonstrations where you had antagonistic protester, counter protesters, sometimes episodes of violence, you know, sometimes armed intimidation, those kind of things. So I'd love to hear each of you speak a little bit to this, you know, the, the, what your research showed with respect to those who participated in and have now been indicted. Um, and uh, and start wherever wherever you want to start. Um, I can take the first part of that, talking about some of the uh, the folks that we we took a, a bit of a deep dive on. Um, we we profiled two people, um, and I mentioned earlier that you know the organized groups, um, Oath Keepers, Proud Boys, Three Percenters, are the ones who are facing the most serious charges. The first person that we looked at was a, a woman named Jessica Watkins, who ran an Ohio militia. Um, called the Ohio State Regular Militia that was affiliated with the Oath Keepers. And she has attracted quite a bit of media attention in large part just because she thoroughly documented her role in the attack on Parler as it was happening. Everything from like taking selfies inside the building to, um, I'm paraphrasing, but essentially saying after the fact, yeah, we absolutely stormed the Capitol. And you know those posts on Parler became a big part of the, uh, the uh, Justice Department's case against, against her. Um, and in terms of her activity on Parler, so you, you earlier seemed maybe a little bit surprised that uh, 
Ivanka Trump had, had joined only in December 2020. Actually, the, the peak of activity, both in terms of posts and signups on Parler, took place um, the week after Joe Biden was projected to win, which I believe was November 7th. And um, you know, she she joined on in December as well. So she was part of this wave of people who were just flocking to the platform um, in the wake of the election. And when Stop the Steal was kind of at its peak. Um, and then the second the second person we looked at was um, this a man named Makaja Jackson, who's um, based in Arizona. Um, he uh, was seen on the day of the attack, uh, affiliating with a group of, of Arizona Proud Boys, although he maintains he has had no contact with the organization prior to that, he's not a member. Um, and we looked at him because I would describe him as sort of a bit of a, a citizen journalist slash uh, right-wing provocateur, um, and is really embedded in this, this pretty like close-knit network of, of activists and, um, and, and posters. And part of what made him appealing is that he's just so prolific. Um, and you could see what he was doing on Parler versus what he was doing on other more mainstream platforms. And you could kind of compare that, that distinction, which I mentioned earlier, where he was saving his most sort of pointed remarks for, for Parler. And um, I'll address some of the geographic questions you asked about protests. Uh, so we analyzed the residents, so we looked at the place of residence for those that were indicted um, at the time we were doing the analysis about 650 and change. Um, and what we found was that there's a statistically significant clustering of uh, protests. So that means around each of these residences. So that means that every person that was charged, there's a clustering of protests of, you know, related to, you know, ranging from COVID to BLM to stop the steal. So uh, they're impacted by their local environment. But then we looked also at the state level, and this uh, work was in collaboration with our colleagues at the Bridging Divides Initiative at Princeton. And we looked at, um, they looked at the, at the state level, do we expect it so how many protests do we expect to see due to population? And what we see is this actually pretty complex picture where folks are probably more influenced by their local level. So the, the protests that are happening around them and then they're influenced at the national level. So what we saw in um, Texas, for example, was that there were a lower number of protests, but we see higher number of folks that were indicted. So they're protesting against, you know, COVID lockdowns, other kinds of like quote unquote COVID lockdowns, right? So COVID protection measures, I'd call them. They're protesting against those, but those aren't happening in their state. They're protesting against these activities in other states so there's this these really kind of complex decision matrix where people are impacted by both what's happening at their local level, but then they see what's happening nationally and then react to that as if it's also happening where they live. Super interesting. Kansas, do you want to jump in on this before we take a couple audience questions? I mean, I just I think what was remarkable too um, when we looked at the video data. So one of the things you know, and, and I, there's been some controversies even within our own team about sort of like what does the video data mean? Um, you know that we we captured, right, there's like 69,000 um, posts that had videos that resolved to an actual set of geo coordinates. And um, for me, I mean, just because it's just so visual, right, it's, it's, it's very striking just how much of that, you know, video content got posted at a greater rate, but all across the country, but there were these little pockets of, of um, you know, high concentration, right? No surprise, Washington, uh, right, because January 6th happened, uh, in Washington, that that ranked as like the number one city where there was this pattern of high clusters. But it was really interesting to sh see that like St. Louis um, was the second highest city. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, that, that made me wonder, you know, what, what's behind that exactly? Is it because that is kind of the historical home of the origins of the Black Lives Matter movement? Mm -hmm. uh, and there's so much tension around sort of, you know, policing and race and um, you know, how much of this, when we think about like localized patterns of political violence, um, I think that's kind of how we have to now approach this, this issue, right, which is that literally, you know, it's kind of like almost a city by city and county by county battle um, for the soul of Americans, right, and to kind of get them to pull back from, uh, you know, political violence, um, because they're, they're reacting to what's going on really just so close to home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, they say all politics is local and all extremism is local. I don't know. It's both local and national, right? So I, uh, I've been trying to skim through these questions while also listening, which is very difficult to do, I will say. Um, but this, this one really intrigues me here. Uh, this question is looking at the data and how the echo chamber built up the fan fiction, which then became their reality. How do we inject complete truths and complete facts? 
And I don't know if any of you have any answers or suggestions, but this is something I think about often too. Like, how do you counter this? Uh, outside of just legislation, things like that, which has its own unique challenges, you know, what, what to do? Um, I mean, I, I want to go back to something that Sean has said earlier about the value of disinformation and misinformation in communities, right? The value of sharing information just generally, right? Um, look, who isn't a gossip in their own family, <laughs> right? Um, and, and there's like, there's kind of a, you can trade on that value amongst your family and friends in a very natural way, very human, right? Mm -hmm. um, on, on these network platforms, right? We have to understand that it's really less about truth and more about performance. Mm -hmm. And it's an extremely performative medium. And so, and political violence is, a, is based on the idea of creating a spectacle, right? In the response to, you know, a perceived slight or hurt or wrong or oppression, you name it. Um, you know, you cannot have political violence without the spectacle. What would be the purpose, really? If people are not registering, you know, that this is happening and it's just happening in a closet somewhere, it's not effective, right? It's not an effective method of influencing people. And so this is, this is really important to understand that it's a little bit less about truth and injecting facts, although that's important. And of course, we want to find ways to counter that. And it's more about understanding that platforms by, by design, unfortunately, um, tend to amplify uh, this value creation, this social capital pyramid um, that rewards uh, misinformation when it's shared in groups. It, it, it's just the way it works. Mm -hmm. um, and so the way to counter this is to regulate technology, right? Mm -hmm. The way to, to, to counter this is to make platforms responsible for um, being more transparent around not just content moderation choices, but literally about like what's in their algorithms, right? Mm -hmm. yes. um, and then how many times, you know, are they actually seeing violations of their terms of service online. Um, they, and it needs to be done with regularity. Uh, these are the kinds of things that, you know, when radio started, when TV started, um, you know, eventually Congress came around to the idea that in fact, there have to be some rules and standards. Um, and now we've reached that point. Uh, it's really much more about, you know, regulating um, the technologies in a way that prohibits people from um, I think oversharing, right? Uh, misinformation and disinformation, but others probably have some other thoughts on that. Um, I mean, I'll add two points. I think one is potentially putting truth aside for a moment, not saying that truth is not important, but oftentimes what we fight about is the truth. Like Candace was kind of mentioning here is that beating someone over the head with fact checking whenever we don't agree that the fact checkers are valid. Uh, right. All that happens is we're angry and we dislike each other even more than we did before the process starts. So another way to think about this is how, how do we reconfigure these relationships? Who are the brokers in different communities that people trust? So, and also think about this, the kind of stickiness of once you believe something, right? Every time you encounter information, whether it's misinformation or disinformation, that can reconfigure how you make a value determination. So we can say, look at some of the early uh, pronouncements Trump had about COVID not being serious. So that was stickiness to folks that really believed him that didn't stick to those in, in their value network for those that didn't believe him. And so we can see those different configurations. So who are those brokers that potentially can have those conversations, but there's not really a quick process. And finally, one of the other problems is access to data is a huge issue from these platforms. So once they remove content, the content's not available to the public, nor is it available to journalists, governments, researchers, academics. Mm -hmm. So we can't really look at, we just kind of see the fallout. Mm -hmm. And if we were lucky enough to collect some of that data before it happened. So if I'm clairvoyant, which sadly most days I'm not, then it's diff I can't collect that data because I didn't know this was about to happen. And so we don't have access to really understand what happens so we can research it, uh, journalists can report on it. Um, members of government can, you know, understand and analyze, you know, policies. So having access to that data is also important, but this is going to be a really long-term, a fairly slow process, and there's sadly no quick fix. Um, that, that segues in, and this will be the last question, uh, to another one related to this, which is looking forward to 20, uh, looking toward 2024, we're approaching a critical point where deplatforming and third-party moderation of extremism slash misinformation 
uh, bad actors may fail given the adoption of alternate platforms with vertical integration and lack of care of reputational risks to their platform brand? What can be done to, to mitigate this? Such a great question. Um, I, I think we're all going to be scratching our heads and trying to figure out an answer to that for the next you know, two, three years. Um, you know, one thing I want to note is that, you know, the parlor lawsuit against Amazon, which, you know, was lodged against uh, Amazon immediately after uh, it was, uh, parlor was taken offline, first in federal court, and then eventually kind of skittered over to, to state court where, where it is now in Washington state. Um, that's still going on. And, and so, uh, you know, I'm really curious to see how that will be resolved. Uh, you know, there's obviously been a request for, uh, you know, a summary judgment you know, just throw it out, don't keep it, whatever. Um, but it looks like it's going to go to trial now uh, sometime in February. And so that, uh, you know, if Amazon succeeds in convincing the court that it did not violate, uh, it did not, there was no breach of contract with Parler, um, and that in fact it was Parler that violated its terms of service uh, and the contract and did not mind the store essentially, um, that has some interesting ramifications, I think, going forward. Uh, it's in state court, Right. Um, and Parler, it's not totally clear to me that, you know, uh, the lawyers for acting on behalf of Parler would pursue it in some other venue or how they could if they, if they were reversed. Um, but in any case, it's, it's going to be significant. And I think we're going to see, um, I suspect actually we might have a repeat. It might not be Parler, could be Truth Social, uh, which, you know, Trump ever actually does get online. Uh, right. with his new <laughs> social media uh, platform. We'll see if the SEC allows that to go forward. Um, it could be True Social, it could be Getter, uh, it could be Rumble. Um, you know, it's it's curious to me that, I mean, there's a lot of stuff on Rumble. <laughs> I mean, a ton of stuff. In fact, you even have some of the indictees, right? Um, one of whom I think actually is uh, defending himself in, in uh, federal court here in DC, who was just, you know, airing all kinds of crazy stuff, uh, you know, online on Rumble still. And so it's curious to me that Amazon has not, for whatever reasons, um, you know, I'm not sure who their provider is, Rumble, but it, it's just sort of interesting to me that, um, you know, large scale uh, hosting services like Amazon and others haven't taken a harder look uh, at some of these fringe platforms already. Uh, and maybe that's a conversation that needs to be had. And maybe that's something that Congress needs to really um, start debating now. Um, you know, yeah. maybe we won't catch the 2024 wave, but it's possible. Yeah. Well, I would, um, I've got so many more questions. I'd love to talk about other platforms. This is something I know Ryan Goodman here, we're going to hear from next has, has written about and, and done some research into places like the Donald.win, which we haven't even talked about, which had, I, to my mind, an enormous impact on uh, the Stop the Steal movement on January 6th. But uh, I will get in trouble if I don't pass the baton here because uh, we do have so many more great speakers. So, uh, and for those, I know there are lots of questions uh, that have been proposed and there will be more time uh, later in, in, the, in the rest of this um, event for those questions. But right now we are going to hand things over to Ryan Goodman, the Editor-in-Chief of Just Security, which is an online forum for rigorous analysis of national security issues, foreign policy, civil rights issues, Issues. Uh, I know uh, Ryan very well. We've we've worked together before. I posted there. It's a, it's an excellent resource. And also Justin Hendricks, who's the CEO and editor of Tech Policy Press, a nonprofit media venture focused on ideas and debate about the intersection of technology and democracy. And nothing could be more critical right now. They're going to talk to us in particular, I think, about the status of the two ongoing investigations. So we're talking about the congressional investigation by the House Select Committee, as well as the Department of Justice investigation. And just to kick that off, these are very different things, and this is and this is so important. The, the congressional investigation is in service of Congress's legislative authority. And are there legislative gaps that need to be filled? Are there things we need to do to address and prevent this from happening again from a legislative and oversight perspective? The DOJ investigation is a criminal investigation. So off to you, Ryan and Justin. Thank you, Mary. And uh, thanks to Candace and everyone at New America and, and all the other partners uh, in this event today. I'm very pleased to be joining you on this uh, this anniversary um, of, of the dark day. And I appreciate Candace's opening at the event, um, just sort of centering us and grounding us in um, you know, the atrocity of January 6th, um, first and foremost. Um, so on to the next slide, I'll just quickly um, introduce myself, uh, as Mary said, uh, I'm Justin Hendricks, uh, editor and CEO of a, a relatively new 
uh, independent media site called Tech Policy Press and also an associate uh, research scientist and adjunct professor at NYU School of Engineering. And uh, Ryan. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Ryan Gibbon. I'm a professor of law at NYU School of Law and then co editor in chief of Just Security. And like Justin, um, it's really uh, an honor to be here with such uh, an incredible group of experts. And I'm learning so much and uh, look forward to the rest of the conversation as well. And I think we'll go to the next slide where, where uh, Ryan will describe the, the clearinghouse at Just Security. Um, so very quickly, um, the Clearinghouse of Just Security is something that Justin and I created and then curate, which uh, we hope is just an open access uh, public resource to anybody who wants to look at it, the general public, researchers, staffers on the Hill, and others. And it tries to be as comprehensive as possible in terms of collecting all the government documents, all of the documents that are being produced by the Select Committee. Um, and, and then it's a reference point out to others' research. So different organizations and academic institutions that have collected and curated and analyzed the criminal cases, for example, um, is a huge part of what we're trying to do there. So if also people who are in the audience uh, think that some of their research is not in the clearinghouse, just you know, send us a link um, and we're happy to add more because we want it to just be generally accessible uh, to everyone. Okay, and on to the next slide. Um, I, I think one of the things that you have already got a sense from the earlier presentation here um, is just the scale of January 6th um, as a phenomenon. Um, and I, I quite like this visualization, which comes uh, via Kate Starbird, um, a researcher at the University of Washington and its uh, Center for an Informed Public, um, that, that tries to depict, and this was uh, early work uh, from her, uh, tries to depict just the kind of um, massive mechanism uh, behind the big lie uh, and how that uh, showed the interaction between a variety of different uh, entities and groups um, and groupings of people, whether political elites, media elites, um, supporters of the, the former president, um, and then, of course, uh, extremists uh, who ultimately um, were willing to, to do violence on, uh, on January 6th and the attack on the Capitol. Um, and we're going to give a little update today on the investigations, um, chiefly the DOJ and the select committee investigations, but also a handful of others, um, and try to relate those back uh, to the topic of tech and, and social media on some level. Um, but you know, if you if you think about uh, this this general phenomenon of January sixth, there are investigations essentially looking into all aspects of of, of what you see here in this diagram. Um, so we'll go on to the next slide where I think Ryan will, will pick up. So um, with Mary McCord's uh, comments as well, I think it dovetails very nicely with that, which is to think about the major or primary investigations and then the secondary ones. And the major investigation on the congressional side is, of course, the House Select Committee, which is conducting oversight and is building, in a certain sense, a historical record that can go into some of the underlying causes of January 6th. And on the other hand, the other primary kind of investigation is on the Department of Justice side in the criminal arena. And that's very narrowly focused on individuals and organizations that have criminal liability that can be proven in court beyond a reasonable doubt. So that's a very broad um, lens and a very narrow and specific lens. And then we just thought out of uh, an effort to be a little bit more comprehensive to list a few other secondary investigations. There is an ongoing investigation in the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, which is looking more into how uh, the Trump White House uh, interfered with the Justice Department to try to overturn the election, a criminal investigation in the state of Georgia, um, in which the um, prosecutor is looking specifically at Trump and Giuliani and how they try to potentially interfere in the Georgia election, civil cases uh, that are being brought by certain members of Congress, some uh, Capitol Police force members um, against multiple defendants, but definitely including uh, President Trump, that might produce um, a wealth of information through civil uh, litigation. And then the other civil case that's a very recent one is by the Attorney General of the District of Columbia, which he has uh, taken a suit against the Oath Keepers and Proud Boys as organizations and as their members. And then the next slide uh, just gives a little bit of a capsule uh, summary of the Department of Justice's current uh, body of arrests and indictments. And I just thought it'd be notable to say one thing in terms of empirical research that draws from this database. The Department of Justice states that about 2,000 to 2,500 people entered the Capitol, all of whom could be indicted, but only in a certain sense, 725 
have been charged. So you have to think about if you're going to just take the database of, of charges or those who have been charged, uh, open question in a certain sense, how representative they might be of the entire group of people who entered the Capitol. Um, just to say a few other words besides the ones that are there, but the top line one uh, might be important to um, spotlight 275 people charged with corruptly obstructing an official proceeding. And then when I get to the next slide, I'll not, not get to it yet, uh, about whether or not this will reach to the upper echelons of power, for example, maybe President Trump himself, that is one of the most talked about charges that he has some exposure um, for that uh, particular charge. Did he aid and abet, aid and abet the 275 or some of the 275 people that engaged in the activity? Uh, just a couple of other additional statistics that I think are useful to think about uh, the people who have been charged and the topic of our conversation today. The majority of them, according to the George Washington University Program on Extremism, the majority, over 77 percent, their charging uh, documents are based on evidence from their own personal social media accounts or others' accounts. That also might suggest something about how representative those are. Um, more than 80 of the defendants, more than 80, have uh, ties to the military, the vast majority of those being uh, veterans, and about 78 uh, militia members um, have been charged. So that's like Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, um, Three Percenters. There are about 40 people who have been charged for conspiracy, and the vast majority of people charged for conspiracy are uh, Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, and Three Percenters. Um, so the next slide is just uh, up to the minute <coughs> kind of information about uh, the attorney general statement yesterday uh, that he made. So Mary Garland in a certain sense was addressing in part some of the criticism that there's no sign inside the justice department that they are in fact investigating not just the foot soldiers of people who were there, but uh, people who might be higher up all the way to the former president of the United States. I highlighted here the key uh, words that he uttered that suggest that the Department of Justice will, in fact, follow the evidence and follow the law. Um, and if the investigation leads to Trump, then uh, that's where they'll go. And then the last one, he also says, we follow the money, um, which indicates a wider conspiracy or organized or criminal activity that might be something that would come within the lens of their investigation. One uh, caveat to that is um, some people also have a nagging concern that there is no evidence uh, to suggest or public evidence to suggest that the investigation is really um, that large. Um, and that we would by now probably have signs through the media that um, Trump associates, for example, uh, would be subpoenaed or being called in for interviews or things like that. It's very hard for the Justice Department to keep such a massive investigation if it were uh, ongoing uh, under wraps. So I think the next slide is uh, over to Justin. Okay, just to uh, go to go quickly now through uh, where we're at with the House Select Committee, um, which has got spun up now uh, up to 40 staff, according to a recent report, um, and uh, it's in the process of hiring additional investigators, including, uh, I believe, uh, some individuals who are meant to have expertise in, in social media, um, has interviewed over 300 witnesses, looked at 35,000 documents. Um, we've seen two resolutions uh, citing contempt of Congress uh, for uh, Steve Bannon and, and for um, uh, former Trump Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, um, and 52 subpoenas, including to uh, multiple uh, members of militia, including uh, Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, and First Amendment uh, Praetorians. So on to that next slide. Um, and just a, a quick uh, recap, I, I'm not going to read all of this um, to give you some sense of uh, how those subpoenas break out across uh, individuals tied to the former president, uh, people involved in organizing the events and rallies that led to the January 6th uh, insurrection or led up to it, um, individuals uh, part of the Stop the Steal effort, um, and then uh, former Trump officials, DOJ officials, um, and a number of others. Um, and I, I think importantly, um, you know, here you're, you're seeing the committee move reasonably quickly uh, to, to lodge these subpoenas uh, and to pursue them. Um, and a number of observers have, have remarked on the, on the pace at which they're working. So we'll go on to the next slide. Um, I just wanted to kind of pause for a moment and uh, remind folks of the, of the legal remit. And of course, the select committee is looking at the facts, circumstances, and causes, trying to get to the bottom of what actually happened 
uh, on January 6, um, you know, who's who's responsible and who should be held accountable. Um, but it's also looking at a range of other things um, is, uh, you know, including the activities of, of, of intelligence agencies, law enforcement, the armed forces, uh, trying to understand what information the government had in advance of January 6. Um, and crucially, you know, how uh, the government, a big part of that question is the extent to which the government um, looked at uh, evidence that was very apparent on social media sites like Parler, uh, like uh, the Donald that indicated that the violence uh, may indeed occur at the Capitol. Um, and so there is language inside the, the select committee uh, legislation um, that talks about influencing factors and getting to the bottom of influencing factors, uh, looking at technology, including online platforms um, and uh, other factors like financing and um, uh, you know a topic Mary brought up, malign foreign influence potentially um, around, around January 6th. Um, so a lot of the language is really looking at also then what should the government do to better prepare for the future? Um, and so what are those types of policies, protocols, processes, procedures um, that would permit the government to uh, avoid a similar event attack in, in future? So we'll go on to the next slide. Um, and this is just based on a recent New York Times report, uh, but just to give you some sense of how the, the committee works on the inside, um, they've got these color-coded teams uh, working across uh, different aspects of, of what's happening, um, including looking at uh, violent extremist groups and uh, big lie, stop the steal uh, organization. So trying to look specifically at those, those elements of, uh, of, of what happened prior to, and we'll go on to the next slide. Um, and I believe here, I'll turn it over to Ryan. Yeah, so just wanted to pause a, for a moment on something that has not gotten much attention, which is the Senate Judiciary Committee's uh, independent investigation. And they issued an interim report in October of 2021. And what I'd mentioned earlier, which is an investigation about how the White House um, interfered potentially with the Justice Department and pushed the Justice Department um, to open up investigations of supposed election fraud. And I do think it's an important lesson of the power of disinformation campaigns because of the kind of hydraulic pressure that was created inside the Justice Department and FBI to respond to um, the ways in which there have been public misinformation. And just by way of political context, it's not as powerful right now in the sense of versus the select committee because of a 50-50 Senate that hampers their subpoena power, but um, it actually has a potential for life after the 22 uh, midterms. So everybody expects that the uh, House Select Committee will wrap up um, before the end of this year, but the Senate side might be able to continue. And then the last slide, uh, just thought we'd mention a different legal dimension of this. There is ongoing litigation around the Select Committee's work. The primary one is Trump, uh, the former president has tried to block um, the White House records from being turned over to Congress, but in all likelihood that'll be resolved fairly soon at the US Supreme Court. And he has in some many, in many senses of the word, a, a losing hand. So I do think that the Supreme Court will vindicate uh, Congress. And then the last is just to note uh, for folks who came to this um, event, there are multiple lawsuits now by some of the witnesses to try to block subpoenas, especially of their phone records. I highlighted one out of the others that that one is not like the others. Uh, Amy Harris is actually a photojournalist who was documenting the Proud Boys and uh, she has sued uh, the select committee trying to block them from getting her phone records and the like, saying that it's her sources. And she's backed up by uh, one of the top First Amendment lawyers in the country and uh, multiple journalist organizations have made statements in her favor. Uh, so she's very much unlike the others. And then I think the last slide we have is just, uh, Justin and I thought to throw up a few ideas as to the final thoughts about what is the objective of these investigations uh, so one is just a uh, shorthand here, possibility of accountability, uh, which might occur without any shift in public opinion, but this might result in criminal referrals or other forms of accountability. Truth seeking for the historical record. Um, and uh, that's in a large part what the uh, House Select Committee is trying to do. And uh, findings and frameworks that may be valuable for the future. So ways in which they certainly, at least for the Select Committee can maybe get to some of the root causes and the ways in which social media and the like uh, led to both the uh, big lie and then also the radicalization and violence that we saw a year ago from today. And I think we have a slide with our contact information. Um, and once again, we thank you for having us here today. 
And I look forward to hearing from uh, anyone that has additional information that they think should be included in the clearinghouse. Candace, over to you. Um, there's so much that I realized, wow, I, I thought I was tracking what was happening in Congress and uh, with the DOJ and all these different lawsuits, but I realized that it's just massive what's going on. So, um, and it's a great segue actually for our next panel uh, because I think it really kind of sets the tone. We, you know, we've talked a lot about sort of the online realities and sort of, you know, how that relates to the offline. Um, but, you know, there, there is an after January 6th as well. And um, so for our final panel today, uh, we're gonna be talking with Jared Holt, uh, who in addition to being a leading expert on far-right extremism in the States, um, is a resident fellow at the Digital Forensic Research Lab at, at, at the Atlantic Council, uh, a great friend and colleague uh, and a very important thought partner for us uh, in terms of the research that he does. Um, Jared has just published a, a report on um, the aftermath and the impact of the insurrection on domestic extremist movements uh, called After the Insurrection, How Domestic Extremists Adapted and Evolved uh, After the January 6th Capitol Attack. And we're going to hear more about that from Jared uh, and also our other guests on this panel, uh, Shannon Hiller and Eric Ward. Um, all of these folks are partners of ours. Uh, Shannon uh, is also a neighbor and friend uh, and is the executive director of the Bridging Divides Initiative, which is a nonpartisan non research initiative based at Princeton University that tracks and mitigates political violence uh, in the US. Um, and they've done a lot of great work over the last year um, on trying to understand and track different events uh, across the country uh, without which we could not have done our research uh, nearly as well. Uh, I also wanna welcome Eric Ward, uh, who really doesn't need a ton of introduction <laughs> in the same way that Mary and all you, all you guys don't need much intro introduction. Um, but in any case, he is the executive director of the Western State Center. Uh, and he's based in the great state of Washington. I hope I'm correct about that. Um, and, and where he works on uh, the challenge with the rising authoritarianism, hate uh, and violence, and with the Western State Center um, helps to empower marginalized communities to work at the grassroots level on trying to counter authoritarianism and attacks on democracy. Um, Eric is a nationally recognized expert on authoritarianism uh, and he has most recently uh, and quite famously was awarded uh, the Civil Courage Prize and was the first American uh, in the 30 year history of that prize uh, to, to receive that award today. So really thrilled to have all of you uh, on, this, on this panel and in this conversation with us. I wanna start with Jared um, because Jared, you, you really did dig down um, to try and, and track um, what happened after the fact and what changed for uh, some of these militia movements, white supremacist movements that we saw that were very active on the day. Um, and, and we know that also, you know, the response from the tech community and the tech companies uh, in some ways did impact that. Um, just the kind of deplatforming and then the, the you know, uh, on the individual basis, but also uh, in terms of the, the platforms themselves. And um, I just wonder you know, if you could tell us like what, what changed? Um, quite a bit changed. You know, part of the reason that I wrote the report that I did and, and published it when I did is because, uh, you know, extremism should be understood as a fluid, really. Um, you know, as we do the important and incredibly necessary work of going back and making sure that we have documentation, uh, data, as much information as we can about what happened, so that hopefully we can learn and grow and, and craft policy and civil uh, action and et cetera to combat it. It's also important to make sure that uh, we understand how things are moving. So after the Capitol attack, a lot of the groups, uh, extremist groups and diehard Trump supporters alike, went home thinking they did something really great. Um, they were very proud of themselves. This, they were talking about this being the next, you know, the first shot in the next American revolution. Um, there was chatter of follow-up events in D.C. and elsewhere around the country. Uh, but then as arrests started happening and as tech platforms started cracking down on uh, some of the most visible components of, of what went into January 6, a lot of that turned into paranoia. Um, and that paranoia effectively did lead, for the most part, um, to a on-the-ground organizing freeze for a couple of months. You had leaders of 
extremist movements like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers actively discouraging attendance at protest events. Um, in a lot of cases, they were afraid that these events were honeypots set up by the federal government to entrap them and build out uh, you know, draconian anti-terrorism watch lists, uh, you know, fulfilling their wildest fantasies of government persecution against themselves. Um, so a lot of things have happened in the last year. Uh, most notably, I think, is sort of the decentralization of at least the organized component of extremist organizing. Uh, so, you know, instead of coming to D.C. for these high profile national events like they did, especially in November and December and then again in January, uh, producing January 6th uh, during the Stop the Steal movement, a lot of what ended up reemerging um, was kind of a push down into local, regional, and state level actions. Um, and, and this was talked about by leaders in these movements as a way of potentially avoiding scrutiny and also of uh, kind of leveraging as much efficacy as they could in affecting change. Often at these local levels and these regional and state levels, the knowledge and the resources to push back against these movements isn't the same as it exists on the national level, where even just in the, the time that I've been doing this, the last, you know, six or seven years, uh, has improved tremendously. Um, you know, our research, our knowledge, our, our competence on this issue has, has gotten leaps and bounds uh, better than it was when I started. Um, but then at the same time, uh, the ideological components of these movements have continued to crawl further into the mainstream. Uh, you know, you have hosts on networks like Fox News, you have elected politicians like Paul Gosar, Marjorie Taylor Greene, you know, kind of extending their hands out to these, you know, more fringe uh, extreme ideologies and sentiments and pulling them into the national stage. Um, and that's concerning because, you know, when we look at who participated in the Capitol attack, there were extremist groups, there were militias, definitely people who showed up with the intention to unleash violence. Um, and then there were a whole lot of just diehard Trump supporters who, you know, whose uh, beliefs in conspiracy theories and election lies and misinformation propelled them through the doors side by side with those groups. Um, so, you know, the ideological components are going further into the spotlight and the mainstream in conservative circles uh, from what we found. Meanwhile, the organizing components are, uh, you know, sort of decentralizing across the country, which I think uh, provides kind of a unique landscape um, that is going to require some shifts in the way that we think about uh, solutions to this and countering the most violent uh, outcomes of, of these ideological ideology spreading. So, so I, I want to get to Eric and, and Shannon, but I want to drill down a little bit further, um, Jared, on like, well, what are those shifts? And also uh, a related question, you know, we saw also, and we, we're continuing to see, you know, the doxing of individuals who were present uh, at the Capitol, uh, you know, there, all of their information out there. We've seen also, of course, uh, there was a, a, a leak of the Oath Keepers, uh, you know, forums and emails. Uh, what, how, what should we make of that in terms of, again, just shifts at the, at the movement level, but also shifts for, for the public and, and lawmakers? How, how does that relate? I think uh, the effect it's had on the groups, um, especially data breaches and you know, the increased collection of data from platforms like Parler and Gab, um, the hacking of data that's been provided to researchers and journalists, uh, et cetera. It's revealing uh, details on these groups that weren't pre previously known and that I think kind of puts them into a more defensive position and, and motivates them more to try to decentralize in that sort of way or to you know seek out alternative tax solutions to prevent that kind of thing from happening, whether it's encrypted chat, whether it is um, you know, go, even in some cases, building their own online infrastructure uh, to try to guard against that kind of thing. Uh, because, you know, for better, for, I, I mean, I guess it's the silver lining here is that although way too many people 
in this country, uh, you know, according to polling, are at least supportive or indifferent towards this. Um, the majority, at least at this point, is still not supportive of it. Um, so there are consequences uh, that come from it. But we have learned a, a lot of alarming things from, uh, you know, for example, the Oath Keepers hack, um, some of which uh, were sort of, you know, uh, things that many had suspected already, like the high presence of uh, law enforcement and military and groups like the Oath Keepers. Um, but to get that confirmed and to get that on record is is no small thing. Um, and to be able to quantify it and really look at it that way, I think, enables research communities, uh, journalists, uh, and even the general public to further understanding of what exactly the threat is here. And, you know, it's the old, uh, you know, Rage Against the Machine song, right? Got to know your enemy. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting, actually, I, I, this is, you know, from a policy perspective, because we know, you know, the U.S. military, the Pentagon has been, uh, you know, undergoing this review. They had the stand down immediately after the January 6th attack, uh, we're looking at extremism within their ranks. Um, a little harder to do that with so many different police forces out there. Uh, no clear indication that there has been some national movement, uh, you know, by leading uh, policing organizations uh, in that direction, although that's a conversation that maybe should happen. Um, Eric, I want to turn to you because I know this is something uh, that you track, that you understand the impact on, uh, on marginalized communities in particular. Uh, when, when police and law enforcement, uh, you know, and uh, members of the military uh, show up and show out, uh, in, in these kind of formations. What, what is the psychological impact? And then how should we think about some of what Jared said in terms of the adaptation and the kind of um, the paranoia now uh, that may be pushing people into darker places? Certainly, I think it's an important question in terms of uh, uh, there's almost a symbiotic relationship right now between the digital sphere, what happens in terms of the issue of governance or government and what's happening in the ground uh, in communities. And neither of them are the originating source. I think we have to understand that there is a, a, a connection, a dynamic that is occurring between those three spheres that are threatening democracy and opening up the space for, for political violence. When we think about January 6th a year ago, I first start thinking about uh, 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 in 2020, when FBI Director Christopher Wray uh, told Congress that racially motivated violent extremism led by people subscribing to some kind of white supremacist type of ideology was the nation's leading domestic terrorist threat. And that was three weeks to the day before the attempted kidnapping, which was initially planned as an execution of Michigan Governor Gretchen uh, Whitmore. I, I share those stories because I think it's important for us to understand that the, the real horror on January 6th was not just the white nationalist alt-right stop the steal breach of the U.S. Capitol. It was a, a willingness of our institutions, right, our systems of governance to turn a blind eye to the white nationalist violence that had been building in the country uh, over the last four years. And also, as you have pointed out, the racial and political bias that resides within law enforcement and within the military that provided permission uh, for that violence to proliferate. I think we are in a moment where uh, these dynamics are, are still very much uh, in evidence. Uh, we can talk about Portland, Oregon, and what has occurred over here over the last four years, but I think it's important to talk about things that have transpired since January 6th that tell us uh, the second important piece here, which is the insurrection uh, that began at the US Capitol on January 6th has not ended. It has spread to communities and towns around the country. And who are the new targets are not elected officials sitting in Congress. They are health workers, they are educators, they are civil rights activists who are looking to uh, uh, address inequality, and they are local government itself. The, the police play a, a significant role in this moment that I think is worth unpacking. What the role that they play is that they signal, right, to a community whether law and order will be upheld, right, 
or whether communities uh, in their division, uh, in their political divides, uh, will then begin to rely right, on their own rules of engagement in these moments. Uh, the invisibility of, of law enforcement should also be noted uh, as of at least the beginning uh, of this uh, uh, panel today, none of the major uh, law enforcement associations uh, uh, in the country have put out messages uh, in support of the 140 law enforcement officers uh, who were injured uh, at the Capitol last year. This, this, uh, uh, this moment in terms of law enforcement is critically important. Uh, it is being driven by its own uh, influences of digital narratives, right, that paint law enforcement has under fire. Uh, uh, that is not the case. Most communities, uh, most data shows uh, that communities are supportive law enforcement, uh, but what they want is unbiased uh, law enforcement, uh, law enforcement that focuses on its mission right, not playing into the political ideological divides that are occurring. Uh, it is a sad and frightening state of affair, and I'm happy to dive more into that. But I want to say one other thing. As we talk about the dangers of, of law enforcement, right, uh, uh, the proliferation of extremism in the military, the impact that that has on local communities, right, understanding this uh, insurrection is still ongoing uh, uh, around the country, I think it's important for us to remember uh, a few things, right, which is that this insurrection has not gone uncontested, neither before January 6th and certainly not after uh, uh, January 6th. We are watching elected officials, business leaders, community activists, right, those in government uh, begin to coalesce to respond. Here in Oregon, and I'll stop here, that coalescing uh, uh, resulted in the expulsion of a sitting state uh, representative by the name of Mike Nearman here in Oregon, who had planned his own state level insurrection uh, 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 weeks before January 6th. And I think it's important to note that he was removed from office uh, by a unanimous vote. The only person who didn't vote for his expulsion was himself. That meant every Republican, every Democrat, uh, here in the state of Oregon, uh, voted to expel uh, 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 this uh, elected official who had dabbled uh, into extremism. And I think we can do the same thing both nationally uh, and the state level around the country. We are not powerless in this way. We're not powerless. I mean, I think that's a really good point. And I just want to note that, you know, that's uh, it's a story that that particular story that you just mentioned about Mike Merriman, you know, it hasn't really gotten a lot of coverage. And yet this would be the day to do it, right? If you're going to have a story uh, you know, about sort of the impact of January 6th, one year on, um, there, there's a perfect example. Uh, and it's, it's surprising, you know, I love my former colleagues in the, in the news business, and I really respect and revere them. Uh, and of course, the institution of journalism generally, but it is, it has been surprising the kind of lack of um, real dedication of resources to covering beyond Washington, beyond New York, um, really, what was the impact of the local, because this is very local, very local movement. Um, and I just want to say, you know, I, I was raised in a family uh, where, you know, my father figure, my uncle, he was a crime scene investigator, right? He was a cop uh, for 20 years. Uh, I have deep respect for uh, the profession of policing. I covered the military for a long time, deep respect for the military. Uh, but the, the profound lack of leadership has been striking uh, from, you know, large scale organizations like uh, uh, the Brotherly uh, Protection uh, Policing Protection uh, Association, right? Uh, PBA. Extremely um, shocking that we haven't heard from them. We haven't seen that kind of leadership uh, from some of the more prominent members of the law, enforce law enforcement community. Uh, while we have seen some, I think, from the Pentagon, we certainly need to see more. Um, but you also raised, Eric, some interesting questions about the kind of the locality um, and, the, and the, the potential for both accountability and potentially reconciliation. And I know, Shannon, this is something that you think about a lot and you have been tracking uh, at the local level as you kind of look at the unfolding of political violence over the last year. What are your takeaways uh, from how the current response to, to January 6th and, and the evolution of that response, uh, you know, both from domestic extremist movements, but also from, uh, from lawmakers and other leaders around the country? 
Sure. Thanks, Candice. And, and thanks to Jared and Eric for, for their critical work in this area. Candice, you said we're friends, but you're making me go right after Eric, which is we're gonna, we might have to reconsider uh, that one. <laughs> Um, I, I would say too, uh, you know, the, um, building off of, of Jared's work, we also did a little bit of an internal review of some of the weekly monitoring we do that often links to, to Jared and Eric's great investigations and looks at offline trends. Um, and, uh, you know, how do we translate those to communities so they can actually take action um, before they start gaining momentum and you know, the sense I got looking back on those weeks of, of monitoring and reports for communities was a real profound sense of backlash, a uh, uh, sort of whiplash too, um, that we, as Eric mentioned, we did have a moment of bipartisan rejection of the violence on January 6th, but it was so fleeting. Um, we saw, even as early as February, more stop the steel demonstrations in communities, localized demonstrations around these partisan audits um, of established election results. Um, and so we saw that around election trends too. You know, we, we also saw it around the topics you all were just digging into now. Um, it's this constant drumbeat of racial justice issues. Uh, we were reporting on the shooting of Dante Wright, you know, mid-year, but also the many, many cases um, in Georgia, uh, in Kenosha, in Charlottesville, um, that kind of felt like an onslaught. Um, and so some of the progress we might have felt um, in, in what some have called uh, a racial reckoning last year and really uh, the backlash of which led us into January 6th. We saw more of that uh, this year. And I think there's been some really incredible writing from folks like uh, Hakeem Jefferson on how that relates to January 6th. Um, but then, you know, it's, it's hard to forget that we uh, communities were also uh, getting ready for a hot vax uh, uh, summer. Um, and then we see how quickly um, come July and August with the, the introduction of Delta, um, this resurgence um, in COVID related demonstrations. And that gets, I think, to so many of the threats and harassment we've also seen since 2020 and, and the uptick in the end of this year. Um, you know, in, early on in the pandemic, we actually saw a mix of, of local demonstrations, people calling for all types of solutions uh, to COVID and to the pandemic, people also against mandates. I mean, these are important issues that we have to find space locally to discuss. This last round of demonstrations, though, were almost exclusively anti-mandate, anti-mask, um, and as we've seen so prominently, um, often involved uh, groups like the Proud Boys um, uh, even being applauded for intimidating local officials. So, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, I know we're hopefully going to get into some of the positive ways we can, can work on this at a community level. But certainly looking back on the last year, I'm not feeling that we're in a better place than we were before January 6th of, of 2021. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned um, the kind of the vigilantism. I think, and Eric, you were kind of alluding to this, essentially, that, that there's this sort of um, this uncapping, almost like an or uncorking of vigilantism that has occurred. Uh, and we've seen that you know, before January 6th and after January 6th. Um, we're all tired of COVID. I don't think anybody in this country or in the world is just tired, right? And there's a lot of aggravation, a lot of frustration. Um, the ability to contain it is difficult. But I'm going to say some things that are going to potentially be controversial here. Um, there are a lot of business owners, uh, small, medium business owners, who have been deeply impacted um, by what has happened with the COVID restrictions uh, and protections and so forth. Uh, and, you know, a lot of those folks belong to a certain demographic, a certain class, um, and they've been really impacted, right? And so the story that they're, they are telling themselves, which is not a wrong story, but it is a story that they have been telling themselves, is that um, all of this is about sort of, all of it, there's a convergence, right? You know, uh, where the federal government is out of control uh, and then people of color, you know, who are raising questions about the way um, business is done in this country when it comes to race politics uh, and the protection of our civil rights, um, you know, that's also out of control uh, and everything's out of control, we're out of control. Uh, and I think, you know, at, at the local level that manifests in all kinds of different ways, we, we documented, Ben in particular, uh, the two uh, folks that we followed and looked at, the, the two folks who were arrested, you know, um, one of them was out there with, you know, a group of Proud Boys in Arizona, uh, you know, and the whole thing was to, to prank uh, by ripping people's masks off their faces, right, uh, and getting really confrontational about this stuff. Um, so I, I want to come to you, Eric, and then you, Jared, and just, you know, looking forward here, um, you know, what can we expect 
how do we respond? Um, what are the measures at the local level, the national level? Um, because I think that now that everything is decentralized, as you say, Jared, right? Like now that we see this paranoia leading to decentralization in these movements uh, on the hard on the far right, um, there's a real concern that okay, it's it's atomized, right? It's just out there now in the atmosphere. Um, so what should the response be? Maybe Eric, you want to go first? Yeah, it, it will be uh, 31 years ago this spring that uh, I physically attended uh, my first white nationalist meeting. And uh, folks can follow up to, to hear that story. But I, I, we've learned some things over this 31 years. And if we want to know uh, how an African-American can spend the day with white nationals, right? Uh, the, the key is understanding that there are three things that are driving this current moment. Uh, the first is we, we have to understand that this is a movement that is drawn towards a conspiratorial worldview. So they see this moment as a existential fight. And that's a critical to know in formulating responses. They are seeing this moment as uh, a fight between good or evil. The second is that Jared's report really underlines some critical pieces. While it's about the digital sphere, right, and how that manifests in the real world, we should understand that Jared is also pointing out that what we are seeing is a fully fledged social movement, right? Now, it's not a social movement grounded in inclusion. It is one grounded in exclusion, but all of the variations of post-January 6th that shifts the movements point to a social movement. That is what a social movement does when it finds itself in a violent moment, whether that violent moment is January 6th, whether it is Charlottesville, or whether it is Oklahoma City, this is how it responds. That tells us that what happened on January 6th was not a political disagreement, but it was an attack on democracy. So the second piece is we have to remember that this was an attack, both physical and politically on democracy. The third piece that I would just say is uh, again, we have to recognize that there are, there are communities around the country, right, who are trying, right, to contest for democracy, for American democracy. And what they see signal from national organizations, from elected leaders, from government agencies, tells them very much each and every day whether that fight is in vain or whether it should be continued. The, the real danger in this moment is actually not the insurrections, right? The January 6th investigation, critically important. There are still threats that we must face, but the real threat is the inability of the federal government, right? To unify communities, to support communities in this fight for American democracy. Paramilitaries, to get very specific, paramilitary groups will continue to face, uh, to be a significant threat, right? We watched them here a year ago in Portland, Oregon, right? Driving around in protest in the field in the back of pickup uh, trucks, uh, using paint guns to target both counter protesters and just pedestrians walking down the streets. Uh, we watched government laugh that off as a prank or, or, or uh, trying to get at liberals. But those of us who understand uh, what is happening in this country understood that that was just a dry run. These are folks practicing right, how to point live uh, uh, weapons at individuals on the streets and pull the trigger. We can't wait as this evolves. So I would just say three things very quickly. The first is, is for those of us who are collecting data, right? We have to not just release our data to the media, right? We have to begin to share that data in advance with community leaders and elected officials. They shouldn't be finding out this information the same day that journalists and the rest of the public finds it out. They should have access to this data and universities and our national organizations should figure out ways to facilitate that. The second is that media and journalists, this is a message and it's a hard message to deliver because journalists are under fire right now uh, across the political spectrum, facing increased physical attacks as well. 
But it's important that journalists begin to cover the full story, not just militant pro counter protesters kicking in windows, not just white nationalists, but the law enforcement response, the business response, the response by community leaders and the impact that January 6th has had on communities. The third is simply this, we need federal agencies to step up, right? A Portland, Oregon on its best day at its most high functioning moment could not uh, garner the resources to respond to these intrusions by authoritarians into our community. But guess what? Neither can DC, neither can Los Angeles, neither can Des Moines. We have to have federal agencies partnering with local communities if we are to push back against this authoritarian movement. And finally, uh, a tip of the hat to the January 6th investigative committee, who is very much taking this seriously and understanding this will not get cleaned up in six months. This is a long arc for the struggle for American democracy. We can do it, but it has to be both a federal and a local engagement that is unified. Candace, can I just um, double down on something that Eric said about data um, with an example, even just from this past week? Um, you know, I think many of us watched last September as this Justice for January 6th political prisoners um, event in the community of folks who were watching it, folks did not expect a big turnout, but the coverage uh, and the ways uh, we talked about it uh, leading into it ended up sort of, I think there was more law enforcement and media attending last September than folks actually uh, down the road at the Capitol. Um, you know, this week, we also have more of these January 6th um, political prisoners events that we're not expecting to be widely attended. We have seen them, they exist. Um, but uh, to a point in Jared's report, one of the more concerning trends there is uh, local officials uh, and uh, elected leaders, at least four sitting members of Congress, attending events like this and then putting that narrative uh, back out into the public sphere. Um, and so I think, you know, we did a quick brief on what's the past history, where have these happened before, where are they scheduled? Um, so that's the focus on the threat side. But to the greater point, the whole story is there's also a lot of vigils happening all around the country today, seeking to unify the country and tell a story about how we could uh, move forward together um, and actually commemorate this day together. So I think just an example from this week on how do, how do we actually action on this information um, as it's happening? How do we put these events and these negative narratives in context of the other positive work that is going on? You know, I, I'd bet that our reporting by the end of the week is going to show there's been much greater turnout at these vigils looking to advance a, a unified narrative than a relatively minor turnout um, at these uh, more problematic uh, events. Yeah, great point about the Justice for J6 movement, right? And Jared, you do talk about this in your report. Um, and I wonder if you could touch on that in your response. And just thinking about, you know, Donald Trump today uh, was supposed to hold one of these Justice for J6 uh, rallies. And he, I guess, decided um, he wanted to shift the, the eye uh, of the public elsewhere today. Um, but we know that on January 15th, he'll be in Arizona, which is, you know, a hotbed of this Justice for J6 movement. Uh, as well as a lot of the militia members, right? And a lot of the arrestees as we've documented. Jared, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, even though Trump kind of bailed out of his press conference today, I can imagine it was probably even a bridge too far, uh, all things considered for Republican allies. Uh, the fact is that, you know, these movements, even though, uh, I mean, to Shannon's point, even though these events aren't, you know, drawing large amounts of people, I like I saw some uh, video of people down at the Capitol this morning, you know, saying how terrible it was that, you know, the, the media and the Democrats or whatever are uh, villainizing January 6th. And it was maybe like six people max. Um, but then, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates show up and like they're part of acknowledging this problem and coming up with solutions to these problems is also identifying sort of these high profile uh, individuals who are essentially extending their hand out to these causes that aren't vastly popular. There aren't 10,000 people down on the National Mall today rallying about this. 
in using the resources and the positions they have to inject this into society. And even, you know, even if this doesn't produce 10,000 new Proud Boys recruits, it spreads this sentiment and spreads this ideology further and further. Um, and in terms of sort of the earlier discussion of, you know, going forward with this, it's hard to come up with a whole lot else to say that Eric didn't say, uh, just abducting the words from my brain in real time. Um, but <laughs> the, uh, I, I think collaboration is a huge part of going forward because, um, you know, and I'm so glad you picked up on this, Eric, like as this report kind of shows, like this is a social movement. This is not, you know, this weird little cluster of groups and certainly they're there and they have their own threat profiles and like reasons to, to keep an eye on them. But there's a broader social movement happening in this country um, going towards a really dangerous direction. And, you know, there, to combat it, you almost kind of need a counter movement. Um, and, you know, hopefully that is one that is based in the pursuit of fact and in the you know, preservation of multiracial democracy and equality and inclusion in this country. Um, but, you know, it's, I think it's imperative that the research community, press, concerned members of the public, activists, et cetera, like are all in communication, sharing data, um, because, you know, getting a bunch of clicks on an article is cool, but it's not, it's not going to save face in democracy. Um, and, and then, you know, kind of zooming out to like the bird's eye view, um, you know, a lot of these movements capitalize on social disorder. Um, and I think it's also important in discussions to acknowledge um, that fact that, you know, social disorder is a you know, ripe ground for people to build conspiracy theories out of, for people to spread lies and foment hate out of, uh, and being able to address that social disorder and take actions to promote productive conversations and, and unity and, and sort of a collective push towards righting some of the wrongs of society, towards empowering uh, disenfranchised people in society, I think is crucial uh, part of the equation, even if it's not, you know, immediately concerned with extremist groups, um, it, it's going to be part of the solution in getting us to the other side of this problem. So, um, such amazing points. And, and like, I, I realize that we've just been talking to ourselves here. Um, and there's great audience q and I, I want to get to that because we only have a few minutes left here. At least one of the questions that I want to raise um, that's um, been brought up here by Eddie, and I'll just tail on to what Eddie has asked here. So a lot of politicians, Eddie points out, um, use fear to appeal to voters, right? And, and we've been talking about this social disorder, um, you know, the kind of this challenge with your identity, and like, are you in, are you out? Um, and financing those um, politicians and groups, uh, you know, is, is a part of that appeal to, to fear, right? Um, and we know, also uh, that there's, an, a, there's kind of a convergence with online advertising uh, and with you know, tech platform governance uh, and, uh, and that politicians you know, who are running for elected office who are actually even sitting in office today um, are doing an end run around what we would call sort of normative rules of the game. Eric, can you speak to that a little bit? Um. Look, uh, we know fear sells. We know that we are living in a populist moment, uh, uh, not just here in the United States, but, but globally. And uh, populism has become the, the narrative regardless of the consequences. And uh, uh, the, the truth is, is uh, it gets facilitated though by things we do have control over, right? Uh, for instance, Right, but the federal government could provide direct support, right, to uh, local communities who are seeking, right, to hold accountable uh, uh, tech companies that are helping to facilitate havoc 
right, in communities. I think about six months after January 6th, and I think of the We Salon, right, a, a, a Korean-owned salon where there was a rumor that there was an individual uh, uh, who sexually targeted a, a, a child, right? It, it kicked off, uh, uh, it used transphobia to allow the alt-right to organize uh, weekends of violence right, that led, there were stabbings, right, there were beatings, there were weapons being brandished uh, on the streets of LA with very little law enforcement intervention, by the way. But the key piece is even the best social media platforms, right, uh, Twitter, uh, who does take this very seriously, was allowing this law to proliferate for months across social media with no response. Business owners lost days of business in the midst of a pandemic. There is no avenue for them to seek redress uh, for data companies who are allowing this to happen. Look, elected officials will always be elected officials who peddle hate, who peddle bigotry and division, uh, rather than speaking to the actual needs of, of, of communities. But it is really digital platforms that are allowing this to proliferate. And states and local communities have no recourse to, to hold this account. I'm pretty sure that if I set up a company that specifically uh, by byproduct led to the economic depression of a community, increased tensions, uh, uh, that community would try to hold me accountable. We're just asking the federal government to open up avenues for local communities to do the same. Good point. Uh, so we have one, probably just enough time for like one more question here. And it's, it actually picks up on what you just said here, which is giving um, local communities avenues to respond to the proliferation of this hate online, um, the stoking of that violence by politicians and elected officials, uh, and even apparently members of law enforcement, potentially members of the military. Um, and, you know, Shannon, you and I, and Jared, you know, all of us kind of research geeks, we've talked a little bit about the challenge around data and data sharing. Uh, and one of our audience members asked, you know, um, what can we do to encourage data sharing uh, in a kind of, in all kinds of ways, not just tech platforms, but, you know, Shannon, you're not reporting on tech platforms, you're reporting on protests, right? But if we didn't have that information, uh, we would never be able to kind of divine kind of these trends, right? So, um, Shannon, to you, and then maybe just 30 seconds for each of you uh, to comment on that last before we close out. Sure. Thanks, Candace. I mean, I, I think it gets again at part of what what Eric was highlighting as part of the purpose of the research we're doing, especially at this moment uh, for our nation, for our democracy. Um, I mean, I think part of, when we reach out to folks about partnering or or what we're trying to do with with data and information, it's about getting it in the hands of decision makers who can help people keep people safe, can find opportunities to open up dialogue. Um, can bring critical information into their communities that will help them advocate um, to tackle some of these tough issues we've been discussing here today. So, I mean, I think there, there is some opportunity there um, to talk about ways we can be creative, whether, whether it's at a federal level legislation, opening up avenues for information from platforms or just between each other as researchers and, and organizers and anyone who, you know, as I think Jared and, and Eric both eloquently put it, you know, is, is trying to fight for an inclusive um, democracy today. So, you know, that, that's part of my pitch when we're trying to break down these barriers is and now is the time. Um, and I think we've found some, some success in that. And I think we've, we've also heard a lot of gratitude from communities who have been able to action on that information. And of course, investment. Jared, what do you think? Um, I think all of that is right. I think, you know, the research consortium that, uh, you know, just security that like uh, Justin and Ryan were talking about is like a great model of this. It's it's still on a national scale, so it would probably need to look a little different uh, on state and locales. Um, but ultimately, I think the point is that, you know, sharing data or sharing findings or, or accounts or whatever you have to offer uh, isn't just going to happen. It takes concerted effort. It takes, you know, sitting with what you have and thinking about who needs to see it and doing whatever you can in your power to get it there. Um, and I, 
I don't know if the research community could, you know, just stand to, I don't know if it's just, just like dropping the ego a little bit or like having to come to Jesus moment, but, um, you know, hopefully as this next year goes on, uh, we'll see more of that. Agreed. Eric, you get the last word here. Look, and, and very quick, uh, I want to thank both Shannon and Jared and uh, everyone on this call uh, who have worked over the last year, uh, uh, over the last years uh, to preserve American democracy. Uh, yes, uh, American democracy was attacked on January 6th, but it was also defended and preserved. Uh, uh, 140 law enforcement officers uh, and many others stood their ground. Uh, on that day in defense of American democracy. So did uh, uh, congressional members and uh, so did leaders uh, uh, around the country. And we should celebrate that uh, on January 6th as well. We have work to do and data is essential to that work, right? In ensuring that that data is used at all areas uh, of society, not just media, but at the grassroots, at the government policy piece is essential. And the last thing I will say is also the sustainability of those who do that research. Uh, they are looking at uh, some of the ugliest aspects of uh, American society that can't but help uh, to be absorbed, right? And so as we are building uh, these amazing set of researchers and, and data analysts, let us also take care of them so that this work can be sustained over the long haul. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. Thank you so much. We're gonna keep defending democracy here at New America uh, and with all of our partners uh, and in our lives on a daily basis. And I hope we go out and remember that today uh, and the days going forward. I wanna thank all of our partners, especially Atlantic Council, Just Security, Bridging Divides Initiative. Uh, thank you so much for your contributions and thank you to the panelists. And we'll see you again soon.